Hello, welcome to part three of this video series where I am constructing a inverted pendulum. In this uh, video, we're going to be talking about the modeling and simulation side of things that I've done in MATLAB and Simulink. So in part one, we talked about the hardware. In part two, we talked about the electronics and a little bit of the software. And we got some data from the pendulum uh, that we did during a step response. And now we can construct our model and try to match it all up and make, see if we can get uh, a model of the actual of the actual system uh, before we move on to our controlled system design. So if you're interested in that, please continue watching. So I'll first uh, give an overview of what I constructed in MATLAB and Simulink with regards to the model. Uh, so on the right hand side, we've got the pendulum and the DC motor model. And you can see that it's taking in a voltage and it's outputting the angular position and the angular velocity of the pendulum. And this is the cart position and these are, you know, X dot and X double dot, which is the derivatives of the cart position. So if we go inside that block, we'll see that we've got the DC motor model and the pendulum model. And this is really what I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out because in most cases, like in a lot of the resources online, I've only seen the model of the pendulum being used for the controller. And I've not seen the drive mechanism used. And because my drive mechanism has an effect, or at least I thought it did, on the overall performance of the system, I wanted to model both of them. So if we go in the DC motor model, we'll see that these, this is the equation for the DC motor model. And you'll see it takes in a voltage and it outputs the shaft speed, uh, as well as the torque. And then that torque is what we use. Uh, we convert that to a force through a, a gain block. And that force is then used by the inverted pendulum equations uh, to derive the angular position and the angular velocity and the cart position. So if we come out of this, uh, the rest of it is with regards to control. So everything on the left hand side is regards to control. So in the first one, in the initialized block, we just provide an initial kick to the cart uh, for 0.5 seconds, basically. And anything after 0.5 seconds, basic, uh, the control, the this control block takes over, and the either the swing up controller is run or the upright controller will be will be used. So if we go in that block, we'll see that by the by default, the swing up controller is uh, is controlling the system. And when these conditions are true, which means which is just when the pendulum is upright and it's not swinging with an angular velocity greater than five, uh, the LQR upright controller will then take over. Um, so I won't get into the details of the swing up controller now, um, but basically it just takes in a the angular position and angular velocity of the pendulum and will convert that into a voltage command uh, in order to swing up the controller, the <laughs> pendulum. And it's doing the upright LQR controller is doing a similar thing, but it uses full state feedback. So it's taking in uh, four parameters from the pendulum and DC motor model and then using that to compute a voltage command, which we then will uh, send into the pendulum and DC motor block. The only other interesting thing that I've done is I've created this um, this sort of animation uh, using Simulink's, I think it's 3D editor, 3D world editor or something like that. And this basically is really useful because it, it can show you what's being computed by MATLAB and Simulink. And you know rather than just looking at a bunch of graphs, you can actually see what's happening in real time, uh, which is why it's got this set paste block here. And you can see that the sort of energy in the pendulum is is increasing uh, slowly until until it gets to the upright position. And at that point, you can see that the LQR controller will basically take over. Um, so it is really useful, and this actually matches up very well with what I'm seeing in real life. So it was uh, it's really useful to have this. So next, I'll get into what the equations that I use to cr construct the Simulink model. Uh, the first one is the DC motor equations and these so equation one and equation two you can get straight from MathWorks website uh, equation one is based on Kirchhoff's laws which is just um, 
This is the electrical part of the DC motor, which is just the voltage input is equal to the, vo the voltage across the inductor minus the voltage across the resistor minus the back EMF voltage. And this voltage input is the same as the voltage input that you saw in the Simulink model. And we then, the equation two is basically a torque balance equation. And this is just computing the, based upon the torque developed by the motor, based upon this same current here. Um, we get the angular acceleration of the motor, which is a function of the inertia of the motor shaft and also the frictional losses. Uh, so equation three is what I've constructed and, and what I've done is I've just added two terms here. Uh, basically because I, I, as I mentioned before, my, because I've mounted the motor onto the cart and the motor is driving the cart, the, it, it therefore the motor has uh, an additional load on it which happens to be itself ironically um, and that is modeled through this uh, inertial load term and then also there's a frictional loss term as well associated with it due to the gear that is interacting that is connected to the rack so that's that's the only two terms I've added this is quite a typical thing to do when you have a load on a DC motor um, it was just weird for me to understand it because the load on the motor was itself so that was just kind of a little strange to me um, one of the things I wanted to talk about is these parameters here. Now remember I, I spoke about the that you sometimes have to pay a little bit for some data and that it was the case with the DC motor. So I got the back EMF uh, constant from the torque curves that I get I got from the DC motor data sheet and you know a few other factors you can sort of estimate um, but obviously the load inertia and the load friction I really wasn't I had I hadn't a clue what to do. And that is where the MATLAB parameter estimation tool came in very useful. So next we'll get into the pendulum model. And this is, uh, this is also taken from MathWorks website directly. The only thing I have added was a frictional term that um, this comes from the friction of the rotation of the pendulum itself. So, if you do find that you have some frictional frictional losses inside when you're swinging your your pendulum around, you can model that term in and see if that helps you get a better um, response. Uh, you know your model matches a bit better with the real world um, uh, experimental data. Finally, equation six is what we use to basically connect the two, and we'll see that shortly. Um, so if we go here, we'll see. This is quite a useful sort of diagram just to show how the terms in each one of the equations are sort of feeding into one another. So you can see here that from equation one, you take the I, this current that you compute in this equation, right, based upon the input voltage, that will then feed into this equation. This is the torque balance equation. And then you've got this um, theta dot term, which then feeds back for you to compute your back EMF um, voltage. And that so these these equations are tightly coupled uh, we then have we then take the torque developed by the motor that we also compute and that is we then because torque uh, force is equal to torque divided by R and you multiply that through the gear ratio as well that will give you the force and then that from that you can compute uh, all these parameters here basically and we take the X dot that we compute and we send that into this equation and then we get back into this equation, we, we get back theta double dot and we get back theta dot in order to compute the rest of the equation. Uh, one thing that's interesting to note is that you, when, you, when you're drawing out these equations, if you've noticed that you've got like an x double dot and an x dot here, you only need to compute this and then just integrate it to get that. So that's typically how you'll construct a simulating model. So next we'll go into the modern model matching and we'll see how we can how we can actually now use the model to um, with the parameter estimation tool to match it up. Right, so here we are back in Simulink where we are going to be doing some model matching and model validation. So the first thing I did was I'm going to remove this uh, control signal uh, that's coming from the controllers and I'm going to put in uh, an input um, that is going to be exactly similar to what we've done on the Arduino. So this is a step response of 200 milliseconds uh, at 12 volts, and we're gonna use that to drive the model. 
Uh, the other thing you need to make sure of that you have your outputs match the data set that you have. So you see here I've wrapped it to pi and I've got a, th a pi bound in degrees and I've also got an exposition in centimeters. So that's the that's the value. Those those are the outputs that we're gonna we're gonna check and compare against. So if we go to the apps uh, tab under the parameter estimation tool, we'll get we'll get a window that looks like this, and we can just go ahead and click new experiment. And what it's gonna come up with is gonna ask you it's gonna ask you for the data set uh, that you wanna compare the model with. So as I said, we're gonna use these two outputs. We're not going to use, so we're just going to delete the theta in meter, the um, x in meters and the theta in degrees, and we're going to use just these two. So if we select, so now you need to import the data. So we're just going to find that data set that we used uh, and we had in the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, so this one is the theta pi bound. So we just need to select that those, we need the stamp, time stamp. So you need to make sure and have a time stamp, otherwise MATLAB's not going to know how to compare. Uh, the data set and then we're going to select the encoder angle in 180 degrees that is pi bound uh, we're also going to select we also next need the we need we need the cart position as well so if I just go to here and we need to go back inside that same spreadsheet and we're going to select the timestamp and the cart position so if we select those now we've got all our the data set in um, and we can just plot and simulate this for now just to see what it looks like. We won't do any parameter estimation just yet. Um, so if that simulates successfully, right, so you can see now that we have, we have some results. Uh, so this is basically as best as I could get it. I couldn't, I tried very hard and I couldn't get any more. And the reason for that is because like I didn't model the static friction in the pendulum. I have modeled the static friction in the motor which is reflected into the cart position, uh, but I haven't modeled any pendulum static friction, which is why the, if you look at the simulated results, the simulated results is a lot more oscillatory than the actual um, pendulum. So I would, say, I would say this is still pretty good. And in fact, if you, if you think about it, if it's more oscillatory in the simulated version and it works in the simulated version, then it should work a lot, it should actually be a lot better off on the experimental model, on the actual hardware. Um, so if I selected the parameters, so this is where you'll perform the actual uh, parameter estimation. So if you're not particularly sure, so you'll see all the parameters basically come up that you used, all the variables that you've defined. And if you're not particularly sure about JL, like let's say your load inertia and the BL, uh, you can then go ahead and click OK. And then, it will basically, you can just click this estimation, estimate button, and it will actually try to uh, ma change those values to, to, to get the model uh, to match the experimental data. Um, so that's, that's basically what, what I did. Uh, what I did first, in fact, was I selected the parameters that I wasn't too sure about the most. So I selected these, I think I selected JL first, and and I think I did that alone and then tried to see if I could get a bit, use that, get it a bit closer um, to the model, so, and to the experimental data, and then started checking these other ones and stuff like that and seeing if um, once I got a good value for this one and it was pretty close, uh, I then started trying uh, using uh, varying other parameters. It, it works better when you're closer. So the closer you can get faster the better. So that's why I'd recommend doing doing one variable almost at a time. And then once you're really close, do all of them at the same time and see what you get. Uh, not all of them, just the ones that you're not sure about. So that's it for this part three of this video. I did not want to make these videos too long. Um, we just covered the uh, modeling and simulation side of things and have constructed the model and matched it up with the experimental data. So now we have a really good model to work with going forward and we can start our control system design. So if that interests you, I'll see you in part four of this, vi of this video series. So thanks for watching.